thanks for joining me for the Founders and Startups podcast. This is Lisa Connors Vote. I'm an executive and leadership coach, and I invite you to check out my website at everbetteryou.com. Today, I'm excited to welcome my guest, Yuni Samashima. Hey there, Yuni. Hey, Lisa. Before we get started, I want podcast listeners to know that Uni and I are creating this podcast via video, and then my awesome editor, Josh, is turning it into an audio podcast. So if you're interested in seeing the full video or highlight clips, check out the Founders and Startups YouTube channel. You can find it by searching on YouTube or there will be a link in my show notes. So now I'm going to read you a very short bio for Uni and then he'll tell us a whole lot more during our discussion. You ready, Uni? I'm going to talk about you now. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yuni Samashima co-founded Chicory with Joey Petraka while they were both students at Colgate University. Yuni and Joey met their freshman year, and now 10 years later, they're running a company of 36 employees. In 2019, Chicory facilitated $25 million in grocery orders and generated $6 million in revenue. And Yuni and Joey were recently named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Congratulations on all that, Yuni, and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to our discussion. So, Chicory. Yuni, tell us about Chicory. What is Chicory? Yeah, so we are a technology company based here in New York City. Um, pretty simply, we create uh, advertising and e-commerce solutions specifically for the grocery industry. Um, so uh, the way that we started the company um, was we had this vision of making recipes uh, across the internet shoppable. Um, so my co-founder and I both like to cook, and we realized that we go onto recipe sites all the time, um, but oftentimes we just don't have the ingredients um, to make the recipe in our fridge. So um, we said, hey, you know, people go on recipes all the time, um, and there's this kind of full online grocery industry that's kind of this burgeoning industry. And we realized if people are you know, buying the ingredients in store and that store is now moving online, doesn't it make sense to connect digital groceries with online grocery or digital recipes uh, with online grocery. And so we created yeah. this product that makes recipes shoppable and that allows consumers to buy the ingredients to any recipe across the internet with a couple of clicks. Um, and uh, we partner on the other side with retailers like you know Walmart and Amazon and Kroger um, to facilitate that. So that's kind of one part of our business. We also have a whole advertising side of the business where you know, using kind of the same technology, we we help brands um, target consumers um, in kind of that moment of, of purchase intent. Um, so we have both sides of the business there. So I'm thinking about this, what you said makes recipes shoppable. Mm -hmm. So, well, first of all, what kind of recipes do you, do you like to use? What do you, what do you like to cook? Yeah, so I mean, I personally like to cook a lot of Japanese food. Um, so okay. part of our kind of founding story is that, uh, you know, both, we both come from parents um, and households where the family dinner was very important. Um, and for my mother, obviously, she cooked a ton of Japanese food. So, um, you know, I, I go online, find some Japanese recipes that you know my mom used to make, and then I, I cook those up a lot. Oh, nice. Do they come out as good as what, it, what your mom used to make? Oh, never. Never, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can keep trying, keep trying. So if I'm looking at a recipe online, would I be aware of chicory doing something behind the scenes? Yeah. So when you come across a recipe that we're partnered with, a recipe site that we're partnered with, um, once you scroll down to the ingredient list of that recipe, you'll see a little blue get ingredients button. Um, and oftentimes it'll say powered by chicory right underneath, but it's kind of this pretty distinctive blue button that you see. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so what's the experience then? So I'm making a recipe. I see uh, cinnamon, for example. I see that I need cinnamon and I don't have cinnamon. What do I do? Yeah. So you'll go to the recipe and you'll click this blue button that says get ingredients and you'll see a little pop up and we'll, we'll um, show you a selection of retailers in your region. So grocery stores in your area. So whether it be Walmart or, um, you know, in your area, Peapod, um, then you can select the retailer. You can uh, then essentially log into your account and then all the ingredients that you need for that recipe are added directly to your cart. Oh, cool. That's yeah. really neat. Yeah, okay. And so what led you and Joey to start Chicory? I mean, we talked about your, your love of cooking and the importance of the family meal, but um, what led to that moment when you guys said, we're gonna start a company together? Yeah, so so Joey and I were in uh, went to school together at Colgate University, um, and we were actually in the same acapella group. 
And uh, it just so happened that this acapella group travels around the country and all this kind of stuff. And, and Joey and I ended up getting you know, pretty close um, as, as friends. And um, there was just one night when we said, hey, let's, let's kind of start a company together. Let's see, you know, let's see what we can do. And so actually, initially, we had started a separate company, um, a, a totally separate, different idea. And then uh, we ended up having to go abroad. And um, I went to Australia, he went to, to Florence uh, to study abroad. And so you know, that time difference was a little crazy. And yeah. we ended up kind of um, killing the idea. But when we got back to campus senior year, um, you know, we were just throwing around some ideas and, and uh, you know, we were both just talking about kind of this shopping idea and this cooking idea. Um, and this is actually right before, this was before even Plated and Blue Apron and these meal kits were even out. And so we initially toyed around with the idea of actually delivering the ingredients um, kind of prepackaged and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but you know, you went to school at the Colgate as well. It's kind of in the, in the middle of nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. And doing all of that and storing that, you know, storing the food and, and processing it and then shipping it out, that's like a logistics, you know, company. And when there's two feet of snow on the ground, um, it's really hard to do that. So we said, why not partner, you know, with a with a company that's you know like Peapod or like a like a Fresh Direct or an Amazon, whose job it is to to figure out those issues and those problems and and kind of be the technology middleman in between. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a journey. So, you know, a lot of times entrepreneurs start out with one idea and then they they do the famous pivot, right? So was this was was chicory related to that first idea or was it something completely different so it was actually completely different um and okay. yeah our, our first idea was around um honestly like events so it was like an events idea um and it was basically connecting event producers and event goers i guess it was kind of similar in that it was you know kind of a two-sided marketplace um mm -hmm. but you know totally different space totally different idea Mm, yeah, yeah. But did it help you to, to start thinking about what does it take to create a company? What are the steps? What do we need to do to make this happen? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it was funny. We're, you know, both of us actually, we, we started off non-technical. Um, so we didn't know how to code. And so it was a lot of, you know, learning how to hustle and network and, you know, posting in, in the college forums, the university forums and our respective universities, trying to find engineers to work with us. It was, you know, I, I remember distinctly meeting someone in Australia in this random McDonald's that I had my friend drop us off at. And it was like, I'm meeting this totally random person in this totally different country um, just to see if we can get the idea off the ground. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of, I think, preparatory work to, you know, understand what goes into, you know, actually launching a business and that one didn't actually launch but um i think we, we learned a lot in terms of you know what are what are the thing components and, and uh, um, the elements that are required to, to actually launch something and get something off the ground yeah great so you and i met a few months ago at colgate university as you referenced i went to colgate i was class of 86 i graduated just a couple years before you i think <laughs> um and we met at the Thought Into Action Entrepreneur Program, which is a great program that helps students develop their ventures. And uh, many of them take it beyond the graduation, beyond graduation, right? And they continue to develop those and, and they are amazing growing businesses. There's actually, we just had three Thought Into Action ventures named to the Forbes 30 under 30, including yours, which is amazing. So did you start Chicory as part of the Thought Into Action Program? Yeah, actually, we did. Um, and uh, that was our senior year. And um, it's funny, our, our actual corporate legal name is called Recipe Into Reality. Um, okay. And I think you can guess where, you know, we got the influence from um, going into thought into action. But um, yeah, so we, we joined it senior year. Um, it's a great program that, you know, it connects um, student entrepreneurs with with mentors and alumni mentors that come up to campus once a month. And I think for us, it was really, really important to, you know, being in, being in school, being in college, I think you can end up being in a bubble, right? Um, and being able to engage with, you know, kind of adults in the real world um, really helps yeah. you get out of that bubble and, and really empowers you and feel, makes you feel like you can actually accomplish something in the world. And I think, you know, that combined with the actual mentorship was, was really a, a catalyst to help us uh, get off the ground. 
Oh, that's fantastic. You know, I, I have a lot of fun doing it. I mean, I, I just think it's a great opportunity for me too to go back to campus and see what students are thinking about and these ideas that I never would have come up with in a million years. And it's awesome to be a part of it. So, um, yeah. and it's and it's cool that you're you're still making time to be a mentor as well. So, um, what does that what does that do for you? Like, what's what's your drive to come back to Colgate and be a part of that on weekends? Yeah, I think for me, you know, I think first and foremost, the program actually helped us a ton. Um, and so I think for me, it's important to give back. And I think it's a rare perspective to be able to, you know, I still remember the days when we were, you know, still students. And, you know, I was, you know, I was a molecular biology major. I was in, in like this uh, oncology lab every single day while also interning at Chobani while also, you know, doing, you know, four, four full work, you know, course loads of work. And yeah. so it's hard to kind of balance, you know, school work with actually starting a company. Um, and as students, you know, you kind of, um, it's hard to know what to do. And oftentimes, you know, if, if you haven't started a company in school and you have some work experience before you start a company, it's easy to say, oh, you know, I, I you know, you, you know a lot of things about how the world works already. Right. And so for me being able to, you know, help these students and teach them a little bit about, you know, hey, this is this is how you should be thinking. This is how you should be get you know, the steps that you should be taking. Um, I think is you know, I think for me, it's very fulfilling. Great, thanks for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, when you and Joey were ready to graduate, you know, there's always that tension of, do I find a job? Do I keep going with my venture? What do I do? Where am I going to live? You know, yeah. what was what was that decision like for you? Oh yeah, so that was yeah, that was wild. I had a um. So we uh, going leading up to graduation, um, we had um, gone into we had done like a New York State business plan competition where we were actually selected as finalists um, without even a product. And um, we had yeah we had an MVP that we had just launched thereafter where Joey and I were actually doing the grocery deliveries ourselves. Um, yeah, in Hamilton. Um, and I think you know by the time of graduation, I actually had a job offer on the table. Um, and it was to work for a VC fund in actually in Japan, in Tokyo. Um, and so I was really toying with that. Um, I think the moment, though, that we truly decided to work on this full time. So so Colgate, at the end of you know this, this thought into action program, this mentorship program, has something called Entrepreneurs Weekend. And it's basically a culmination. And, and you have student ventures that get to pitch in front of um, alumni that come back to campus. Um, so these alumni are, you know, successful entrepreneurs, and the board of trustees is there. And, and I think that weekend, the keynote speaker was Cheryl Sandberg. And so it attracted a ton of people to come back to campus. Yeah. And then um, that was on. So Cheryl spoke on Friday night, and then on Saturday um, we had. Yeah, I, I pitched in front of a bunch of alumni, and um, we had this big lunch. And in the Hall of Presidents, which is like this big hall you know, classic collegiate kind of hall. And Hamdi Ulukaya, who's um, the CEO and founder of Chobani, um, was getting an honorary degree at Colgate that year. So he, he gave this amazing speech and he was this like amazing orator. Um, but at the time, you know, my, my co-founder Joey and I, we were actually looking around the table and we're going around the room and we we're saying, hey, like there's, you know, there's a lot of potential here for us. Um, we, should, we should do something. And so uh, right as Hamdi got off the stage and before the president of Colgate could get back on, I actually ran up to the podium um, and grabbed the mic and I said, hi, my name is Yuni. We're starting a company. We're looking for funding. Um, you know, if you're interested, please come talk to us afterwards. And I'm sure my, you know, my voice was probably like five octaves higher than it just was. Yuni, um, that's but, amazing. Did Joey yeah. know you were going to do that or was it just an impulse and you said, okay, I'm going to go do it? We were just talking about it for for like thirty seconds. We're like, we gotta do something about it. Do something. I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna go up there. Um, yeah. And so we had people come up to us afterwards, and they were like, hey, like that took that took guts. And uh, we ended up raising um, thirty thousand dollars that weekend. Um, part of it was from Colgate. Part of it, you know, we had three investors come in who were totally random. Total, we didn't know them at all, but they were all Colgate alums. Um, who who kind of took a chance on us, and uh, that was the moment we said, "Hey, we can you know we can hire a you know a developer, an engineer, and let's let's just try this full time. Let's work on it full time." Wow, yeah. so bold. Sometimes it's really important to follow your instinct and just take those actions. I mean, you were you were really working through the fear, though. I'm sure you were kind of like, uh, "I don't know if I should be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway." 
you know, sometimes this thing comes over you when you when you just kind of block out the fear and you're like, this just needs to happen. And so, uh, yeah, it was. I, I remember distinctly um, the president of the school, his name is President Herbst. He, the look in his eyes when I grabbed the mic was terrifying. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, but I'm glad I did it. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone, everyone at Colgate is glad you did it. Um, <laughs> So then what happened? Where did you where did you guys go next? Did you work out of Hamilton, New York, where Colgate's located for a while, or did you go back to the New York City area? So we did. So we worked out of Hamilton for I'd say six months until it started snowing again. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and when that's happened, we we're like, okay, we need to get out. Um, but yeah, so Colgate gave us like an incubator space to work out of. We were part of this group called the uh, entrepreneurs of New York Fund that the state had worked with Colgate to to give a couple grants, and so we were included in that. And so we, we stayed up in Hamilton for about six months, which was uh, actually, it was, a, it was an amazing time. Summer up in upstate New York is beautiful. And, uh, you know, I think I spent my time then, you know, because we were still, you know, kind of pre-product. We were, we were starting to build our first, you know, beta product. We had just hired our first kind of CTO. And um, I spent a lot of my time networking. Um, pretty much all of my time networking. I think I, I reached out to, you know, part of part of the amazing thing about Colgate is, is the strong alumni network. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I reached out to close to 250 or 300 alums um, who are in tech, who are in kind of the publishing space, who are in uh, advertising and grocery, um, just to kind of pick their brain on understanding, you know, how the hell this industry works. And, uh, you know, even for us, you know, how to manage a, you know, an engineering department, how to think about building products, how to build a financial model, all that kind of stuff, you know, we knew nothing about. So I think those first six months, we spent a ton of time networking. Um, but yeah, but it was a really, really fun time. And then, and then we had actually ended up moving down to uh, Westchester County, right outside of, outside of New York, um, where my mom lives. And uh, we then lived there for probably um, another year, year and a half. Um, wow. wow. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you about the networking. It's really fantastic to hear that because, as you know, a lot of founders get caught up in, I need to build my app, my website, my whatever. They spend all their time working on the product as opposed to getting out into the world and learning more about the marketplace and sort of, you know, building the network as you did. Mm -hmm. Was that, and was Joey doing the same thing or was he sort of more heads down in the product? So, yeah, so, so that, that's, I think, where co-founders are really, really helpful. And um, so he was, you know, he, he was, you know, helping build the product and he was working to get more recipe sites on board. And I was quite frankly, you know, trying to figure out how to raise more money and trying to figure out, you know, how the industry works and just get connections to get, you know, bigger partnerships and that kind of thing. So, so that's where, yeah, I think having a co-founder is so crucial is, is kind of that division of division of labor. Um, because was without that, that hmm? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, without that, you know, it's, it's, you can't just, you, you just can't do it all. Um, it's so difficult. So, yeah. Was that delineation always clear from the start or did it just sort of evolve? Did you guys sit down and say, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that? Um, yeah. So, so that's an interesting question that, you know, I think we get asked a lot about, you know, how did you decide who's going to be CEO and COO and how did you decide who's going to do what? And I think from the very start, you know, I had, so I had worked at a, um, I'd interned at a VC fund um, the summer before we started Chicory. And so, um, you know, pretty early on, Joey was like, hey, you should do kind of the investor stuff and, and kind of the, you know, uh, networking and meeting mentors and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, Joey, Joey's, Joey's, one of the, Joey's, Joey's amazing. Um, He's extremely good at learning new things and picking up new tasks. He probably he's probably one of the smartest people I know, and he can juggle so many different things um, in his mind at one time. It blows my mind. Um, but it was pretty clear from from early on, kind of kind of where our two skill sets were and how we were going to divide that. But we had we had a sit down conversation. We actually wrote down um, what we felt like our roles and responsibilities were at the company. Um, which is kind of a weird thing to do your senior year of college because you really have no idea how a company works. Um, yeah. But it was a, it was a helpful exercise for sure. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad you did that. And that well, like once you sit down and put your vision on paper, it really helps to make it real. Totally. Uh, have you looked back at that paper recently? I wonder what you would think of it today. Yeah, so it's funny. Um, one of the things that uh, so I'm a huge journaler. Um, I've journaled. I have a I have a I have a daily journal. 
um, I have kind of a long form journal. A daily journal is only like a paragraph long that I write in every single night. I have a, a journal, which is a little bit more long form. And then I have a journal specifically for chicory, actually. Um, and literally the day that we started the company, I, I started writing in this journal. Um, and so it's really, really fun to see because I can look back. I think, I think I'm on my third journal at this point, but looking back on the first journal, you know, seeing what we were thinking, you know, talking about the mentors that we were meeting at the time, who are, you know, quite frankly, some of our, our mentors to this day. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's so much fun looking back at that kind of stuff and, uh, and, and really reflecting on, you know, I, I don't think that we ever thought we would, you know, or I don't think we could have ever imagined, um, what it would be like to be kind of where we are today. So yeah, it, it's so, so much fun. That's yeah. so neat. Okay, so you moved out of Hamilton, New York, and you went to a little bit of a warmer climate. And then at what point, so you're up to 36 employees now. So yeah. how did that how, how did that building process take place? Like when did you know, was it, were there certain points that you can look back at and say, yes, we knew then we needed to hire four people or six people or eight people? Like what was that progression? Yeah, so for us, you know, quite honestly, you know, starting a company is hard. And where where we well where we first started to understand you know when to hire people is when we raised funding. Um, so so I think that actually take a step back. The first moment is when we realized we needed you know a technical um, person on the team that can actually build our technology product. Okay. Um, so that was that was point number one. You know we met a couple of people. We we've actually gone through a couple of technical leaders, but I think that was the first moment. Hey, what what? What can we not do? And, and the most obvious thing was this, this technical side. Um, so Joey and I actually learned a little bit of, you know, of, of coding and programming, um, but you know, not nearly enough to, to launch this company. So I think that's that's number one. I think the next milestone was um, we ended up getting into an accelerator um, in New York City called the Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator, which was you know fantastic for us. Um, and at the end of it, we ended up raising um, 1.2 million. Um, as kind of our seed round. And so when you have that kind of money and you know, you're not just gonna spend it on yourself, it's, it's to build out a team. So that's when we, I think, jumped to five employees. Um, and yeah, we had you know, two of those employees still work at, work at Chicory to this day. So, and, and that was, you know, say nice. like five years ago. Um, so, so yeah, I think th those are some clear moments. I think, um, you know, transparently for a little while, um, we were in, I wouldn't say we were in a funk, but we were definitely in kind of a, a period where we were trying to figure out, you know, product market fit is, is what they call it. And online grocery wasn't that big back in 2014 when we raised this funding. Um, and, it, and it really didn't end up being big until 2017 when Amazon acquired Whole Foods. And so for a little while, we were trying to figure it out. We, it's, it's around the time that we were developing our, our advertising products and stuff like that. And um, we were, yeah, we were five or six people for a long time, for I think like a year or two years. Um, and then this kind of, um, there's this moment when we launched our advertising product, Amazon acquired Whole Foods, and all of a sudden we were getting inbound interest. We were getting, you know, our, our salespeople were closing deals. And, you know, we, we realized that, you know, this is, hey, this is, this is becoming something. This is really something. And so we raised a little bit more money and um, we ended up starting hiring more people. And at this point, you know, most quarters were, you know, were profitable, um, which helps, but while kind of maintaining that growth and in the past, I'd say the past two years has been, you know, the biggest period of growth for us. Um, I think this time last year, we were 15 people. And oh, so, wow. yeah, so 2019 has been, you know, a, a pretty amazing year for us. So, yeah. so I think it's, uh, it's those moments when you kind of realize that things are, are working and you need to invest in, in growing that opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are the moments when you know to hire. Ah, that's incredible. I bet your, your journal entries are really interesting in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then 2015, those are, those are interesting in kind of the opposite directions. <laughs> wow. I want to read the book. You're going to turn that into someday uni. Yeah, yeah, no, maybe. <laughs> okay, so funding. Can we talk about funding for a minute? Um, sure. you, you ended up taking venture capital, and some people mm -hmm. do and some people don't. What would you say are a couple of pros and then also cons of, of, of using venture capital funding? Yeah, so it's interesting right now because we're in a really, um, I'd say, frothy environment. There's a ton of capital out there, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things people have to realize is that uh, there are different types of capital out there. Um, so you can go with your, you know, Silicon Valley, um, you know, super high growth VC that's looking, you know, they're, they're really only investing in companies that could ever become 
unicorns and it's either you know boom or bust for them yeah. um and and then there are companies you know there are family offices where you know there's still a lot of money out there for family offices who are looking for two to three x returns which is a very different type of investor so so i think that you know there's there's a couple of you know different um lessons that i think we've learned is is you really have to know what type of business that you want to to build and so if it's that crazy high growth hey like uh, you know this could either be something or nothing um mm -hmm. then um you know traditional vc makes sense um but if you're looking to build something um looking to you know i don't want to call it like a real business but really you know thinking about profitability and thinking about revenues and, and cost of goods and all that kind of stuff then i you know there is also a route to take different kind of money or even you know or even bootstrap it and and be profitable right. um i think there are pros and cons to, to both you know the pros of, of getting uh vc funding and, and kind of high growth funding um is that you you just do grow and your valuation grows a lot quicker um and you can grow the company you know more quickly you can hire a ton of people um, but the cons there is that, you know, for the investor, you know, you're one of a hundred portfolio companies. And so it doesn't really matter if you succeed or fail. They just need one company, one or two companies to really make it big. Um, but for you as a founder, you know, it's, this is your one company. You don't have a hundred companies that you're mitigating risk across. Um, so that's, that's the big risk in there. So they're just going to, you know, keep pushing you to, to grow and to continue to grow and i think that that ends up being kind of unhealthy for for some founders like we're you know we're seeing with you know uh some of the companies that are are ipoing now yeah um, and on true. the other hand you know when you bootstrap you bootstrap your company that's all the way on the other end of the spectrum and um, it's just a slog you know and, and finding those growth numbers can be really difficult unless you have a really really good business model um, and so, but you know, there are companies out there, there are cases where, you know, founders have bootstrapped and, right. and have, have created billion dollar companies. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that there, there is necessarily a right path, but I think that it's, it's definitely a path worth, you know, considerable deliberation before you, before you choose the path. Yeah, and I'm sure you and Joey spend a lot of time discussing the options and the investors, and you were very careful before you actually took in that money. It's not like here's a free one million dollars, and you're like, oh, okay, great, you know, <laughs> <laughs> go on vacation. Yeah, There's a lot of responsibility that comes with a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Uni, you and I have talked before about executive coaching, and you know I'm an executive coach, and you shared that you've you've worked with one. And can you tell me about that? What was that experience? Like, what led you to bring on an executive coach for yourself? Yeah, so it's funny. Um, you know, we, we weren't actually actively seeking out an executive coach. But, you know, like I was saying, there were a couple of years in Chickory's history where we were, you know, I'd, I'd say we were kind of flatlining, um, or we were trying to figure out that product market fit. And, and it was around the same year that, um, you know, we were looking for funding again. So our initial revenue model wasn't panning out. We were, we, we were running out of money. And quite frankly, I had a, I had a very dark period, um, probably for three or four months, um, where I wasn't sleeping every single night. I was waking up at 3 a.m., 3 to, 3 to 5.30 every single night. Um, Oh. And it, it actually took a toll on me, both uh, obviously mentally, but, you know, physically. Um, and so I actually have my uncle is a, is a kind of a, owns his own business out in Portland, Oregon. And he, one of the winters I got there for Christmas every single year. And um, he was like, hey, Uni, I have this really good friend who, you know, he's part of a CEO group with this guy. And he's like, you should meet this guy, Nick. And so when I was out there for you know the holidays, I, I met up with the, this guy Nick that my my uncle's friends with, and you know we were just going through you know I was talking to him about the issues that we had and and kind of the stress that I was having, and you know he he had just some amazing things to say, and at the end of it I was like hey Nick like you know you should really consider like doing this as a job, and uh, he was like actually I'm an I'm an executive coach. And so, and so that's kind of where, you know, Nick and I's relationship, Nick's our executive coach, obviously. And, um, but that's where, that's where our relationship started. And, you know, my, my co-founder Joey was like, oh, I don't even know what an executive coach is. I don't even know if it, you know, makes sense for us. And, um, but we started using him and it's, it's been, you know, completely night and day for us. And, and I'd say part of kind of our, our regaining momentum in the business. Oh. Um, I'd say it was was partially thanks to Nick and helping us uh, really you know get ourselves in kind of the right mindset 
and thinking about growth and thinking about opportunity um, rather than kind of uh, operating the business from this place of, I think, fear and kind of anxiety, which we were um, in those, those like that year that we were um, not doing so great. So it's been, it's been completely amazing. I, you know, I try to recommend it to any single founder, you know, any founder who's raised any type of funding that can afford it. Um, and it's, it's just been, it's just been tremendously helpful for us. Oh, that's well, so good to know. And uh, what's Nick's last name? His name is Herrings, Nick Herrings. All right, good. Hey, shout out to Nick. <laughs> Thanks for a great executive coach. Did you and Joey meet with him together or separately or, or both? So we met with him separately, uh, but Nick's helped us sometimes um, go through some of our issues together. Um, he's come in to talk to the team. We actually um, have some of our leadership team meet with him as well. Um, so he does kind of, kind of everything. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you about Forbes 30 under 30. Um, I They get tens of thousands of nominations um, for people to be named for it, you know, to that list. So it's an incredible honor. What did you, did this come as a surprise to you or, or like, and how did you get the news? Yeah, so um, it's interesting um, because I think that being in a kind of a circle of entrepreneurs, you hear about the Forbes 30 under 30, you know, all the time and every single year that it comes out. And I think this year, you know, we, we kind of saw it coming to a certain extent because we had, you know, a couple of calls with Forbes people, you know, understanding our business and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, quite frankly, we, we've been, you know, we've made it to the penultimate round um, every single year that we've probably been in, in existence. Um, and so we were like, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but the news came when uh, we were actually having our leadership, kind of weekly leadership sync. And... Um, our, our Slack room. We have a Slack room for what we, we call the good news room. And oh. the good news room, it was like nine in the morning and it just, it was blowing up. And uh, we usually have a no device policy, but I ended up checking my phone uh, because I was like, oh my God, what's going on? And, and yeah, that's, someone was like, oh my God, huge congratulations. This is so crazy. So, so it was kind of a, you know, it was a beautiful day. It was, you know, the sun was coming through the windows and it was, uh, it was a really nice moment. And so really, oh. you know, it's nice to get some, you know, external validation here and then. So, yeah, that's fantastic. And how yeah. long ago was that 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 news came out? I want to say three weeks ago. Um, okay, so it's still really recent. And um, yeah. do you did did has anything changed as a result of that yet? You know, um, we we've gotten you know a couple of you know obviously a lot of um, our clients reached out to say congratulations. You know, I got a lot of texts and stuff like that. Um, we've been um, asked to, you know, do some more speaking engagements, um, some honestly some paid speaking engagements, um, nice. which is kind of a first for us, which is kind of cool. Um, um, and yeah, it's just it's interesting because I don't think too many um, people in the grocery industry get uh, uh, the honor of being on the you know on the thir Forbes thirty under thirty. So it's kind of a unique uh, differentiator, I suppose, in in kind of the world of grocery too. Um, and yeah. so. It's been it's been a really really fun couple of weeks, yeah. Very cool, and you'll always have that on your resume. And uh, a few years from now, you'll be on the forty under forty. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you and um, how do you and Joey measure the success of Chicory for you? I, I imagine that in working with Nick, that might have shifted a little bit. Like, like what's a successful day? What's a successful venture for you at this point? Yeah, so you know that's that's the interesting thing because um, part of being an entrepreneur, you know, to be an entrepreneur, you, you just have to be aiming high. And I think what's difficult is if you asked Uni, you know, five years ago or a couple, even two years ago, hey, you know, you're going to have you know over thirty employees, you're going to have two floors of an office in the Flatiron District or Manhattan, you know, I'd be like, oh my god, that's you know that's success, right? Um, <laughs> But there's this funny thing where every single time you reach a milestone, there's there's another milestone yet again, kind of off in the distance. Um, and so, you know, I think for us, it's it's really about taking stock. You know, I think from a business perspective, you know, we're looking at revenue, we're looking at number of orders and, and the number of, you know, we, we also get emails from people um, who use our service and they're like, oh, my God, I have, you know, these health issues. And it's super amazing to just get the ingredients to my like to the blog that I subscribe to, you know, super easily. And so, th so those are always, you know, really, really empowering moments. Um, mm -hmm. 
But you know, for us, I think it's also we we've built a company with with an amazing culture, and um, we've built a company where you know people have told me you know that they don't have the Sunday scaries now um, now that they're working at Chicory, and so. You know, for me, that's 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 kind of an amazing thing, and and we've had so many moments here at the company where, you know, there have been you know some personal losses or you know some things that happen, and and everyone is so supportive of each other, and everyone is so you know um, just good to each other, and people like working here, and I think being able to spread that, being able to grow that, um, and be able to provide that for for so many people is is extremely empowering for me, and um, and so. So yeah, so I I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, absolutely. So, what are you what are you aiming for next? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think where we are right now, um, just in the grocery industry. So one of the things I you know, I I love to read about history. I love to read you know about uh, I just love to read. But one of the things that you end up learning is you can start to. It's an exercise um, one of our coaches uh, calls reading the world. Um, and so you can kind of read the world through uh, what I like to call lines of momentum. So just kind of taking a stock and, and looking at what's happening in the world around you and looking for areas of momentum. So, so for example, in the grocery industry, um, you know, retailers and grocery stores are now thinking about the digital consumer. Whereas before, you know, they were they were purely thinking about how do we, you know, how do we get people in the store? How do we influence the people in the store? How do we get them to buy more stuff in the store? You know, I think now more and more grocery retailers are thinking, hey, you know, people are online. People are shopping, not just in our store, but in all different types of places. Um, and so you kind of have that on the grocery side. Then then you then we've we've seen like the expansion of e-commerce and grocery with Amazon acquiring Whole Foods, with retailers, you know, investing in um, things like delivery and click and collect, which is where you buy it and pick it up in the store. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're seeing a lot of momentum and a lot of brands then, like CPG companies, are seeing their growth come exclusively from e-commerce. Um, that's the only category where they're seeing growth. So we're seeing really, really good momentum on that side. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the other side of our business, on the advertising side of the business, we're seeing um, data regulations come into place which is a fascinating thing to watch. Um, so you have GDPR, um, which is the, the EU's um, data privacy laws. Um, and California just passed CCPA, um, which is um, California's data protection laws. And so you're now seeing all these things happening in the advertising space where collecting data is becoming more and more difficult. And so where we're kind of seeing the intersection for, for what we're doing, um, is you know grocery on one hand trying to engage with that digital consumer and and kind of advertising on the other hand saying hey we can't we're being more and more restricted on what we can do and so what we're doing here at chicory is is we're we're using e-commerce as a tool to engage grocery shoppers in in moments of where, where actually that engagement helps them right and yeah. so if i'm if i'm a hershey chocolate and it's halloween time you know, I want to get in front of that consumer when they're looking at, you know, how to bake these chocolates for, you know, or bake these cookies with Hershey's chocolate and then, and I want to make it easy for them to, to buy Hershey's chocolate instead mm -hmm. of just saying, hey, I'm going to advertise, you know, on, you know, on ESPN and all these places that where you, you might be. It's like, hey, how do I, how do I actually help the consumer? And so that's kind of our, our, our next big goal is, is kind of merging those two parts of our business and, um, really creating an experience that can uh, that can benefit all parties instead of just you know just one yeah okay that's wonderful yeah and do you see an ipo in your future i i don't know i mean that that would be pretty far off in our future um okay. but you know obviously you know we're we're working to to build a build a real company i think i'd say and um, especially with you know you're seeing companies um like obviously like we work um, Uber and um, one of our, our biggest you know competitors at the time when we were raising funding was Blue Apron and they IPO'd oh. at I think two billion dollars close to that and and now they're you know they're there I think their market cap is less than a hundred million dollars oh. and so I think we're being very cognizant about how we how we grow our business and how you know we want to build a real business and I think you know for me one of 
my idols, uh, you know, a lot are like the Gilded Age entrepreneurs. And for them, venture capital didn't exist. And, you know, they really had to, to think about how they're building their business and think about where they're investing instead of just throwing a ton of money at the wall. And so, um, you know, that's how we're building our business. If an IPO ends up being the best way to raise capital in the future, you know, then mm -hmm. potentially. Um, but, but we'll see. Fantastic. Well, Uni, thank you so much for sharing uh, your journey. And is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to share before we sign off? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for anyone growing a business, I think now that we're you know over thirty people, it's it's really clear is is culture is and ends up being so important to the company, and and that always stems from the co-founders. And so I think for entrepreneurs, if you do have a co-founder and um, it's really setting, you know, you really just need to have that kind of heart to heart conversation in the beginning to set the tone and set the values of your partnership. Um, because I think, you know, to this day, Joey is, is one of my best friends and, um, you know, it, we couldn't have done it without kind of laying, laying out the ground rules in the beginning. Um, like you were saying. And so, you know, I think it's, it's finding the right person, finding the right, you know, partner and co-founder and, um, but also, you know, maintaining that relationship because your relationship ends up being, you know, the relationship that the the rest of the company has both to you and, and to each other. And um, so I think that's that's one kind of key thing that I, I'm thinking a lot about recently. Yes, that's great advice. And, and it, you know, it's reflected in your company culture, as you said, like you guys are very mindful about your company culture. And if if you and Joey didn't have a didn't maintain a great relationship, it would be evident that yeah. your employees would be feeling the stress. Yeah. Totally. Co-founder co conflict is a real thing. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Well, thank you, Uni. I have enjoyed this conversation and I'm so glad to be sharing this out into the world. And uh, I wish you much great success and look forward to seeing you at Colgate in the near future sometime early next year. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. This is, this is a lot of fun. So thanks for having me. Fantastic.